Welcome to this lecture on field programmable gate arrays in the course digital system design with PLDs and FPGAs. Uh, last lecture we have looked at the Xilinx vertex um, configuration or programming and we have also looked at certain features which was not available in the, uh, in the vertex uh, kind of device and what are the extra features which is available um, in the new devices citing um, Spartan 6. Uh, then we have looked at the issue of uh, kind of one hot encoding and um, we, we have to kind of finish it. There were little detail uh, left towards the end of the lecture. We will complete that and in today's lecture we will look at uh, uh, similar device or um, FPGAs from other vendors like Altera and Actel not very um, kind of in depth because we have, we have already uh, gone through the vertex uh, device in depth. So, I presume that you will be able to understand that other architectures very easily you know you spend some time and then you will be able to um, make out everything. So, uh, before going to today's uh, lecture part then we will look at the, the last lectures uh, portion briefly. Uh, for continuity then we will continue with today's part. So, let us move to the, the slides. So, in the last lecture we have looked at uh, the vertex configuration uh, one is through the JTAG port um, for prototyping anytime. Then master serial is where the FPGA is connected uh, to a serial prom and in the, in the vertex it was only 1 bit data but in the current devices it can be 1 bit, 2 bit or 4 bit serial data uh, to, to enable to support you know larger devices because um, for a single bit it takes uh, configuration time will be quite high. So, 4 bit sh should reduce it uh, by 4 and uh, the master serial would means that there is a master FPGA clocking the, the prop. In a slave serial uh, the FPGA expect the clock and the data, the, the data in uh, synchrony with the clock uh, to be supplied to the FPGA. This is useful when um, in the serial mode if you chain multiple FPGAs then a, a master will clock the serial prom as well as the slave FPGAs. Then there is a select map mode which is a 8 or 16 bit wide mode. Uh, 8 bit in the vertex but 16 bit in the current FPGA. This also can be in the master mode or slave mode in the master mode um, the FPGA give the clock in the in the slave mode the FPGA expect the clock. Again uh, this can be chained uh, in the current devices. So, this shows a uh, you know the, the this JTAG thing I am not showing because it is simple you uh, normally a JTAG a USB dongle is there connected to the to the PC which convert the USB to JTAG and JTAG is connected to the JTAG port of the board and you can program using the programming tool anytime. Uh, either you can program the FPGA or the serial prom. Even the serial proms have uh, you know the JTAG port. So, it is possible to pro program the FPGA. Uh, in that case every power on it has to be programmed. If you program the serial prom uh, then it is kind of permanent because you put the FPGA in the master mode and if you program the serial prom it is kind of non volatile. Each time at the power up FPGA clocks the prom select the prom and program itself. And this shows an a scheme in which uh, the two devices are shown where the, the bit stream or programming uh, bit programming stream or both are combined together in one prom. The master give the clock and at the data comes it programs itself while it is programming it pushes one and the slave waits. Once it is programmed it pushes the, the, the bit stream for the second device and that programs and so on ok. So, at the beginning uh, both get kind of uh, in, initialized by clearing the configuration memory and to synchronize that process there is an IO pin open drain output and an input which is pulled up and when it is doing in it uh, then it will be low pull low. 
So, uh, whichever FPGA comes out first wait for it to go up. So, that every everything initializes properly then only the programming start. Similarly, at the end of it, it each FPGA takes uh, its own time and you know the last slave programs last. So, this done pin is again a wired and through the pull up with open drain and when it goes high the rest of the circuit knows that um, that the programming is done it can continue the operation and while programming all the pins are tri stated and uh, the rest of the circuit has to take care and all the flip flops at the end of the configuration uh, is reset by internally by the FPGA. And in the in the select map sc scheme the FPGA support um, a 16 bit or 32 bit um, um, parallel uh, configuration interface uh, these are the additional signal and normally this does not match uh, the protocol of the CPU. So, either you have to use a CPLD or use some parallel port uh, to, to make control uh, to make this particular interface. The only issue is that in the case of parallel port this can be pretty slow if it is software control. So, it is worthwhile to have a CPLD kind of built in so that uh, this is done much more faster and the configuration bit stream is stored in the CPU memory uh, to save space and that shows the timing and uh, in the current FPGAs as I said you have the boundary scan which can be single device or chained as in the in the serial uh, configuration the master serial it can be chained or ganged um, that means uh, the serial devices identical devices can be parallel in gang chain is what we have discussed and the, the serial prom can be 1 bit 2 bit 4 bit. The prom itself can be programmed through the JTAG port and the slave serial um, again uh, these devices can be um, 1 2 4 data width. In the master serial um, the FPGA uh, you know uh, clocks a BPI flash with in 8 bit or 16 bit mode. It can be single device, it can be chain uh, or gang and uh, there is a slave uh, select which go along with the master select which is uh, where the clock comes from the uh, external source. And uh, the, the next thing we have discussed was that um, in this kind of scheme uh, bit stream is kind of open exposed people can reverse uh, engineer your design by copying the, the configuration bit stream. So, the current FPGAs have encryption that means the bit stream before programming can be encrypted with an AES algorithm with a 256 bit key and FPGA is programmed through the JTAG port with that particular key it can be permanently fused or it can be stored in a battery backed up RAM inside where the battery backup is outside. And once it is programmed uh, certain configuration can be written not to read back the configuration um, or even the, the key uh, all that can be blocked ok. So, that is uh, 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 the encryption scheme and there is a bit stream compression because only maybe a part of the FPGA is configured. So, if the bit stream contain uh, the information about the all of the resources can be kind of uh, removed from the. Uh, the configuration to uh, reduce the storage requirement and um, the amount of time spent in configuring. So, that is called bitstream compression. It is useful where you have um, less memory space for storing the configuration stream or you want to configure at the power on a much faster than what is usual uh, because every device depending on the device complexity takes certain time. So, when you compress it it has less configuration time. And the another option is that if the, the bit stream you are programming if it gets corrupted then one need to reprogram it. So, it is possible to store a golden configuration in another place in the flash and which works with the SPI flash and BPI. BPI is uh, uh, the, uh, the platform flash with the, the 8 bit or 16 bit interface which also has a JTAG. So, it can be programmed through JTAG. In that case if during the configuration any time a CRC error on the bit stream occurs um, then uh, it can fall back to a golden configuration not a particular site particular location in the memory. 
um, or if there is a sync word detection failure uh, there is a watchdog timer which is watching and it times out then um, uh, the FPGA try to configure from the golden um, golden bit stream. So normally in the uh, whether it is embedded or FPGA golden would mean uh, certain default uh, very tested configuration which is not upgraded which is kind of kept from the beginning and the main configuration is the one which which gets upgradation uh, in the field and uh, so there can be kind of um, uh, corruption because you are writing to the, the flash quite often in that area and um, the, the bitstream itself could be kind of uh, buggy or uh, you know because it comes uh, you know it gets downloaded through the net. So it is possible to have corruption so this multi boot takes care of that. So that is about the multi boot these features can be used in the current FPGAs. Current FPGAs as the DSP slice I said a pre adder which is 18 bit a multiplier which is 18 bit which is uh, giving 36 bit result which can be sign extended to 48 and add with a 48 bit. It is very useful in the DSP kind of algorithms where you have multiply accumulate uh, kind of operation you can have you can have various uh, you know output of this bypass uh, you know uh, adders cascaded uh, the multiplier output taken up all, all possible possibilities are there I am not showing it here like the CLB you can go through this um, the detail schematic which should give you some uh, good idea about it. Um, uh, this helps in implementing the DSP algorithm very efficiently and the tool vendors many a times offer a MATLAB or Simulink interface for such algorithms. So you implement those algorithms in the uh, using signal processing toolbox or simula simulink then that can be kind of e equal and VHDL code can be generated uh, that essentially uses this DSP slice and that can be kind of uh, synthesized place and routed um, uh, in, in the FPGA to generate the bit stream. Uh, another issue in FPGA is that you program the FPGA uh, then it is, uh, it is very difficult to kind of debug you know you, you programmed the FPGA and everything was you know timing simulated but when you program it it does not work as uh, it is intended and then you have to debug it is a big problem because uh, only the external pins are accessible to you if the something is wrong internally then it cannot be seen. So what is done is a, a along with the connected to a JTAG there is a logic analyzer uh, IP and the probes can be connected internally to your um, circuit interfaces inside and you can set trigger saying that um, on this uh, data bus on this particular signal lines if a particular value comes from then onwards you capture or you capture before and after some time and transfer it through the JTAG port to the PC. Uh, to do an offline analysis and debug it. So it is a very useful tool once you program the FPGA and uh, that is called in the case of Silings it is called Chipscope Pro and the Altera it is a signal probe, signal probe. So that shows the picture you know you have you instantiate these kind of uh, logic and connect it to the, to the user function and capture it and analyze it and change the code rebuild and uh, you know go on to iterate and a uh, very important thing to remember is that it occupies certain area. So if you are trying to use uh, the chipscope pro then you have to have some free area to put that IP and sometime that can little bit mess up your timing because uh, unless you uh, floor plan properly uh, the presence of that circuit can upset uh, the place and route if you are not doing anything if you leave the place and route to the uh, to tool completely then uh, it can kind of flatten everything and all logic can get mixed up um, within the area there you cannot say that um, particular your one of the module will be very close together nothing like that maybe the 
uh, this particular chip scope IP and your logic everything can get mixed. So, whatever timing achieved may be upset by the presence of that, but if you floor plan properly there should not be an issue that you should keep in mind and we have looked at the, the pins, uh, the clock pins and the programming mode pins and few pins like uh, the, uh, the C clock program done in it. Um, in it is not a, a dedicated pin, these are dedicated pin, VCC ground, the JTAG port, rest are all are user defined port. Even for the select map interface, uh, the user defined pins are used and after the, the programming it becomes user defined um, pins depending on the programming at the, the power on that can depending on the mode pins, uh, these pins will have the special programming features at the power on. Uh, the next thing, uh, the last thing we have discussed was one out encoding. Uh, the issue is that if you encode, do a binary encoding of the number of states, um, say if there are uh, 5 flip flops and the flip flops come here, 5 input in the worst case, when we say worst case because many a times in state machine uh, you make decision on a particular signal or combination of 2 signals you do not combine all the signals, but then let us assume there is a scenario where uh, to a state um, uh, there is transition from other state on uh, different conditions. So, that can happen. So, when you develop the equation for that state uh, there could be say 5 input condition along with the, the state. Okay. So, such a thing can happen. So, the, uh, the, the effect is that this can become because you have 5 input 5 flip flop, you have a 10 input um, logic implementations required for each flip flop and again once again in the worst case uh, it might require a 10 input CLB which can span quite a lot of uh, logic blocks making this very kind of spread in the FPGA uh, increasing the logic interconnect delay and reducing the clock frequency. Okay. So, the, that is what is I have shown here a particular case of an FSM where in the worst case you can go to 16 CLB which can make T logic very high and we said the solution is uh, to encode um, each state in a flip flop. So, that uh, as far as the state decoding is concerned there are number of inputs plus uh, the number of uh, flip flops wherein you know there is transition to that particular state you know and that we have seen an example uh, where SI on condition I transit to SJ, SJ on condition J remain there. Then the equation will be DJ will be condition I, QI plus condition J, QJ, uh, QJ because SI is um, kind of represented by a single flip flops QI, SJ by QJ. So, this is 5 input condition. So, as I said less likely, but then uh, mostly it will be 1, but then let us take uh, the worst case uh, it will be only 7 input not a big deal. And um, one more thing with the uh, this kind of one out encoding is that many, many outputs will be more type output and in that case output will be high on a particular state many a times or in one or two states. So, the output logic will become just um, yeah, the, the Q output of a particular state or or of uh, multiple Q's. Okay. So, in one out encoding not only the next state logic um, uh, becomes simple, the output logic also reduces that should be kept in mind. The output logic will be uh, or of one or more flip flops in the one in the case of one it can be taken out directly. So, even in timing wise it will be much faster than binary encoding. So, that is about the output logic and um, uh, the, the state um, encoding can be kind of uh, um, manipulated not manipulated can be changed using the user defined attribute. This I have briefly mentioned when we looked at the um, the state machine uh, coding using VHDL okay. and this coding after you know specifying the state type 
uh, this can be mentioned in the VHDL code. So, one example I am showing here say here there is a state type which is defined as you know this particular name state type. So, you say attribute state encoding of state type you say type is grey or that means a grey coder or type is 101 or 100 ok. This is 100 encoding we will see what is 101 and 100 ok. And there is another possibility you say attribute enum encoding for enumerated encoding of state type you say type is and you literally say the encoding ok. Here we are assuming there are 4 state of 2 flip flops and you are saying the first state is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 which is nothing but a grey code ok. Now mind you this is uh, a this is called a user defined attribute. So, it means that user would mean does not mean the designer in here it means a vendor ok, a vendor of the tool ok. And so, you have to check this it is not a, a standard VHDL it is a user defined attribute. So, from vendor to vendor it can change it does not matter it does not uh, kind of um, you know guarantee that a, uh, this will work for uh, the, suppose if it works for Silings uh, it will work for Altera ok. So, you have to check uh, the tool vendors manual uh, recommendation uh, with regard to this attribute uh, to change the state encoding ok. Suppose you are not able to ok now one um, little bit difference between 101 and 100 say 100 101 means true kind of 101 like we have 5 state then you have 0001 because uh, the this flip flop represent the first state 0010 uh, this one represent the second state and so on. So, you have 5 uh, uh, patterns represent the 5 states ok. But the issue is that sometime um, at the power on you want to come to a starting state and if you are using um, um, resets for it uh, it will be troublesome because um, you need a particular flip flop to be 1 and reset is not there I mean set is not there uh, you have to build otherwise into the next state logic. In that case the reset part of the flip flop is going waste sometime it is useful uh, to start with all zeros, then move to this kind of pattern ok. So, mind you that this is a kind of dummy uh, power on state at the, ba at, the, at the beginning it comes to this state and but for all practical purposes it transit to the next state 0, 0, 001 then never goes back there it is only just for starting then your real state machine what you what you design start with 0, 0, 001. So, you have a dummy state which could be a replica of the um, the starting state uh, as far as outputs are concerned, but then um, this is never uh, kind of visited again. So, that is 1 or 0 uh, which is most uh, useful uh, in the case of uh, 1 hot encoding uh, that you should keep in mind. And suppose you are not able to control the state encoding for whatever reason um, using these attribute. Um, which is less likely and uh, mostly the synthesis tool options will support this 101, 100 you do not even have to use the attribute many a times. But um, uh, you have to check that you have to check the tool how that this is handled mostly the synthesis tool um, options will help you. In the case of Silings they have a synthesis tool called XST uh, Silings synthesis tool. XST and that has um, the command line option uh, for this kind of thing. Um, in the GUI there are pull down uh, properties synthesis properties where uh, these encoding can be changed. And uh, if you are not able suppose you are somehow stuck with you want to kind of hard code uh, the one out encoding then you can explicitly um, uh, define the state normally we use an enumerated data type for uh, present state and next state, but then you can say signal present state next state is standard logic vector 3 down to 0 because we have only 4 states and you can literally say constant A is standard logic vector 3 down to 0, 0, 0 1 constant B is like that so on. So, we are defining 
the 1 out encoding and for the state you use A, B, C, D like that you know that is uh, the basic idea. Uh, so, we have kind of uh, come to end of the, uh, the FPGA I have um, in detail I have discussed the vertex and some of the features in the current FPGAs uh, some issues like one hot encoding. Now I am sure that you will be in a position to understand all the silings FPGA you spend some time looking going through the, uh, the data sheets quite a lot of them are there. Uh, there are some parts which I have not covered but you can look at it there could be packages and package details so that uh, you can like when you make a PCB uh, there are guidelines how which package to use and how to do the layouting of the PCB how to route it properly how to terminate certain high speed signal uh, with termination all that you can refer to the, the manual I have not detailed uh, you know discuss the basic electrical characteristics timing characteristics all that can be looked at uh, the data sheet. But um, internally the logic um, the routing special resources configuration um, certain example of how uh, these uh, internal resources are used how it is mapped to the standard circuit all that I have covered. So, I am sure that you are in a good footing uh, to, to now to understand other FPGA from Silinx and from other vendors. But before closing down I want briefly very briefly look at um, Altera and Actel devices uh, because Altera is also a kind of commercially uh, as a good share in the market and Actel has a very dedicated um, kind of technology for the space and uh, high reliability application. So, very briefly we will look at it. So, let us turn to that part. Uh, the Altera has their mainstream high performance FPGA called Stratix series which is you know Stratix 2, 3, 4 uh, I think 5 may be there I am I'm, I'm really not in kind of in touch uh, with these uh, devices. So, uh, but you can you can refer to it pretty much everything is uh, exactly similar to Vertex you know. Um, if you look at the latest FPGAs uh, the Alteras uh, and Xilinx will be kind of uh, similar uh, features they offer maybe one is better in some ways one is uh, better in some other ways. So, first thing to note is that uh, there is little bit difference in the interconnection very marginal difference which is which has a two levels of interconnection. So, little difference you know in Xilinx FPGA you have interconnection matrix and logic block and we have seen that the adjacent logic blocks are interconnected um, uh, you know directly. So, uh, in the case of Altera this is little more extended that is a basic difference here and SRAM based programmable connection no difference logic array block is 10 logic elements. So, you have that lookup table flip flop such 10, 10 elements are connected together in the case of vertex you have 4 uh, you know uh, lookup table um, flip flop combination are there in a logic block. Lookup table is a combination logic no difference flip flop with synchronous asynchronous reset preset DP RAMs, SP RAM, FIFO all that is there and the low skew clock trees uh, and PLL uh, the PLLs are there in the latest um, Xilinx F, uh, later Xilinx FPGAs or other version of vertex carry cascade chain same DSP block with multiplier shift register. Again in the in the vertex series it may not be there, but in the, the later vertex series it is there in the Xilinx. IO blocks registered non registered everything is same multiple IO standard same JTAG parallel and serial configuration is same. So, it is very much uh, identical if you know one you know the other. Um, just I am putting a very large uh, you know high level block diagram which is this is taken from the uh, Altera data sheet and um, you have the IO pins you have the logic array blocks um, you have the DSP blocks here uh, uh, no these are the memory blocks and these are the DSP blocks and there is a big RAM block here 
Um, so that is what is pretty much the architecture which is very much identical to uh, vertex and uh, when I say two levels of interconnection this is what I mean you know you have vertical horizontal metrics with interconnection but 10 logic elements you can see that they are connected to adjacent logic element and between the logic element there is a kind of local interconnect. This is the kind of maybe a, a slight difference between the altera and statics with regard to this, this FPGA. But the later FPGA one need to look at it how it is. So um, I think I will kind of will not elaborate more these are kind of taken from the Altera data sheet these uh, information you can go through their later uh, latest FPGAs um, but it is more or less similar to the uh, Xilinx uh, SRAM FPGAs. So let us look at the actual uh, FPGAs this is uh, quite different you know actual 5.4 SX a really old uh, series but very useful for certain application uh, essentially because it has uh, the anti fuse as a programmable interconnection. So at the beginning we have looked at the, the general uh, interconnection technologies and we have said that anti fuse is a one time programmable solution. So if you send uh, some uh, something to space you know in a satellite uh, then it is exposed to radiation in the outer space and uh, the, the ram or a flash can get corrupted you know. You cannot even think of uh, even if it is radiation hardened you a, an SRAM based FPGA if it is sent to the space uh, there will be frequent corruption it has to be kept on reprogramming if somebody send it uh, probably on an hourly basis. Uh, the bit stream has to be kind of put back you know that is the only way to keep it um, uh, sane. But uh, in an if you if you think of an actual kind of FPGA it is a fuse connection you know it is a it is a permanent connection nothing can get corrupted. So the space and military application basically anything to with the, the, uh, the space uh, where the radiation is there you can use it uh, maybe it is used in. Uh, some weapon technologies I have no I am not um, very clear about it uh, but at least it is used in the in the in the space application and um, the one um, issue we have discussed at the beginning is that since uh, the anti fuse uh, technology uh, take less space and um, less time uh, with regard to the the delay. Uh, there will be the simple um, logic blocks okay. So there are combinational blocks and register blocks which is separate. In the SRAM based FPGA everything is put together but in a in actual 5.4 SX the combinational lookup table lookup table like thing is separate and the flip flop is separate and you can have a kind of a certain ratio by choosing some certain clusters okay very simple IO block loss queue clock tree multiple IO standard and the I must say that the actor actor is the one which had hardware prop pins built into the chip okay. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the internal logic probe or logic analyzer IP uh, connected to JTAG but actor had and two pins extra on the chip and through JTAG one could uh, connect the internal signal to these two probe pins and capture the probe pins to debug. So I think it was a kind of original idea at that, at that point in time uh, to provide two dedicated probe pins uh, uh, that can be probed you know that can be. So instead of taking uh, the probe through the JTAG it was taken through a pin but the configuration was through the JTAG okay. So if you look at the, the combination cell essentially it is a 4 to 1 multiplexer in, in the case of uh, like we have discussed the fine grain FPG architecture we have shown this as an example. So 4 to 1 can implement 2 variables say you connect A and B here then all the min terms are available here you can select it by 1 and 0 you can implement a logic function. But 
uh, it is possible to connect a third variable at the input and implement three variable. But because of the, the presence of this AND gate and the OR gate um, instead of connecting you know kind of one signal you could connect two signal and some combination of the min terms of 5 may because 2 here, 2 here and 1 here uh, 5 uh, inputs can be implemented in the in the combinational cell and this goes to a flip flop and the registered cell is nothing but a flip flop with set and reset. You can choose the clock polarity you can choose from a hardware clock where low skew uh, clock routing and two different other clocks okay. And you see there is a recirculating mux and this is connected directly to a combination cell okay. So, the adjacent combination cell and this is for uh, you know getting the wired connection with through the anti fuse to here okay. So, there is a port uh, like this act as a clock enable uh, to get this and this is also a kind of um, connection for the uh, input from the, the previous C cell. And normally what is done is that they have a clusters uh, two type of clusters uh, two combination cell and one register cell uh, and two register cell and one combination cell. So, uh, these clusters can be kind of mixed together to uh, control the ratio of register to the combination cell. So, maybe in certain device there are more registers in certain device there are more combination cell suited to different application. And the routing is that within say between a C and adjacent C and R direct connection within a cluster there is a one anti fuse connection across a cluster two anti fuse connection. What, what is specified is that uh, the number of fuses used is minimal uh, when the interconnection is close by. So, that you can get a fast interconnect and uh, this is all taken from the actual um, data sheet uh, and this shows the idea of probing there are two probe pins and uh, this is the FPGA. Uh, so, there is a logic there is a hardware uh, which connects to the JTAG port of the FPGA the probe pins and um, this is serially connected to the uh, to the computer and you can give command to connect internal signal to the probe pin capture it and view it and debug it. So, it does not require an additional logic uh, to be put into the chip and this was useful maybe at that time it was a good idea which started by the Actel. And the Actel also has a flash based FPGA which is essentially better than uh, the SRAM in a way because um, even in a SRAM FPGA you know that um, uh, when you deploy something in the field uh, this flash prom is used okay. Uh, to that extent only thing is at the beginning um, there is a configuration time there is a kind of copy from the flash to configuration memory which is SRAM. So, additional um, configuration is involved but here the, uh, the, the programming memory programming uh, is done through the flash memory. So, it is non volatile. So, it is already configured at the power on the chip is ready. Uh, so, that is advantage, but otherwise architecture is pretty much same there is a difference in the logic block. So, there is uh, kind of memory IO pins the logic block uh, just for the, the kind of uh, uh, curiosity uh, this is the logic uh, tile or logic block of this pro ASIC plus. Uh, this is what they have you know this is what is the logic block. First thing to note is that there is no, no flip flops inside okay. That could be quite surprising, but if you look at the combination circuit you have a 2 to 1 mux that means you can implement two variables like one in the select line and one in the input. And there are such uh, two, uh, 2 to 1 mux that is all okay. So, how do one implement an edge triggered flip flop is a question okay. But uh, if you kind of uh, know uh, the circuit uh, then you can you can make out that a 2 to 1 mux 
with this two inverters you know this can act as an inverter uh, can act as a latch ok. So, I am showing that in a picture here this is the 2 to 1 mux this is the select line which is clock this is D uh, inboard and you say D is the clock is 1 D goes to the Q and if clock is 0 Q is latched ok. So, that is what is here shown. So, there is an inboard uh, which goes through this NAND gate which can be by making this one uh, this can be an inverter and uh, to the second inverter it goes it acts as a latch. Similarly look here you have an input say the input then it goes through here it is a latch ok. Now you know that a master slave edge to get flip flop where there is a, a, a master latch a slave latch and there is an inverter in the clock this act as an edge to get flip flop. So, you see this. So, there is this is a clock line which goes to the to the select of the marks one is inverted one is directly going. So, that is how uh, this master slave uh, latch is implemented using this 2 to 1 marks and uh, this particular you know cascading of both you can see the output is going to the input and this is the the real thing. So, this can be very cleverly used as for combinational circuit as well as flip flop. So, that you know it is a uh, it is a use a tile either to implement uh, 2, 2 to 1 uh, say 2 sets of 2 variable implementation or a flip flop. It is a clever idea I, I have not used it. I do not know how effective the, the utilization is and what is the kind of overhead in terms of these kind of switches because there are switches needed to configure interconnect uh, you know uh, chain it together and all that I have absolutely no clue because I have not played with this part, uh, particular FPGA but one can look at it and uh, they have uh, the, uh, the fast connect uh, um, you know between the adjacent blocks there are one long you know short lines of one logic block, two logic block, four logic block length long line across the uh, the device clock tree a pad ring there. So, there is a wires around to do the pin locking SRAM blocks uh, the programming technology is flash ok. So, uh, that kind of winds up uh, the look at uh, the various uh, other FPGAs. Um, uh, the FPGAs from vendors like Altera and Actel. In the case of Actel we have looked at basically an antifuse technology and the flash antifuse is very much useful in um, space application and uh, flash is, is convenient because uh, it does not have the power on um, the configuration time. And there, that is at least the actual FPGAs have certain different architecture and the antifuse architecture is kind of totally different from the SRAM based architecture. Uh, like if you are working in space application maybe you should uh, look at the actual FPGAs. Other FPGAs there are radiation hardened devices available, but SRAM FPGA is prone to corruption um, in the presence of radi you know kind of space radiation. So, that should be kept uh, in mind. So, very briefly since we have looked at uh, the CPLDs and FPGA a basic you know comparison um, uh, we have mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, so, the logic is in a CPLD is always AND and OR and most of it is wasted because there is very wide AND decoding and uh, sometimes the uh, the product number of product terms are quite high. Um, the, the, the FPGA essentially uses lookup tables and there are few FPGAs as MUX and few gates. Uh, the registered logic ratio is small very 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 less number of flip flops, but FPGA has lot of flip flops and even we have seen that lookup table uh, itself can be used as memory, uh, it can be used as shift registers we have mentioned this and uh, so there are quite a large registers and dedicated memories available. Um, so, for all practical purpose 
uh, this is a huge advantage FPGA not only in terms of complexity the register to logic ratio is quite quite huge in the case of FPGA and the timing is very simple because there is a crossbar a central switch interconnecting the the old logic block. So, the timing is simple you know you have one or two interconnection but in the case of FPGA it can be very complex because from one end to other end there can be uh, quite a lot of um, switches programmed and that will add to delay uh, unless one fit in your design and floor plan it properly you would not be able to kind of estimate the timing a priori you cannot say that at the beginning for a complex de de design how much uh, performance in, in case of uh, in terms of delay you can get it. And uh, the architecture variation in the CPLD is very small like you take the CPLD from um, Altera or Xilinx or um, say Atmel the architecture will be identical. But if you look at the FPGA it can be quite different at least the SRAM FPGAs look similar but then you can have um, the anti fuse FPGA which has a quite a different architecture and the programming technology in the case of CPLD is always flash. It, it is good in a way it is non volatile but in the case of FPGA it is SRAM based um, mostly SRAM based so some flash and some anti fuse. With regard to capacity uh, let us look at the slide. See it is limited CPLD has a kind of 10k blocks um, but here there are kind of 2 million uh, look up in, the, in, the, in the, the largest FPGA available now plus lot of memory dedicated memory not we are not talking about the look up table being used as memory uh, the dedicated RAM is quite quite uh, large. So, that is a comparison between CPLD and FPGA, FPGA is very much useful for prototyping. So, by and large uh, the use of um, FPGA is in prototyping that means you want to develop an ASIC you implement that first in FPGA ok. Uh, that is why high end FPGAs are used there are vertex 7 um, very complex FPGA which cost quite a lot is there. But then uh, that enables one to test an ASIC before going into the foundry because ASIC the capital investment or the non recurring engineering cost is very high. And if you go with only the simulation the timing simulation uh, to the foundry uh, then it is a huge risk is involved uh, fabricating it if there is a bug um, you have heard about the Intel bug in the uh, in the you know floating point unit the famous bug uh, you know the, the chip manufacturers have to call it back. Uh, then correct the pro correct the issue. It's a huge huge trouble, you know. Uh, all the production is chopped. It affects you know the a lot of uh, money is wasted, a lot of time is was wasted. Uh, so all that can be avoided by uh, you know putting uh, uh, the design in FPGA. And when uh, say the CPU vendors put their design in FPGA, they have to put it across. Uh, multiple FPGAs ok. So, uh, like if you take an Intel uh, CPU uh, even the core functionality cannot be put it in a single FPGA it might require multiple FPGAs to put everything together. Uh, but once it is tested for long time uh, they are confident and go for ASIC. Uh, one more thing is that many a times at clock speed testing may not be possible like uh, the, if there is a CPU which clocks at 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz um, there is a less very less chance that I uh, you know it can be done in uh, I mean the, it is not less chance there is no chance that you can clock an FPGA even the latest one 22 nanometer can clock at um, uh, kind of 2 gig or uh, 2.5 gig it is impossible it will be in the order of megahertz 200 to 400 megahertz. But um, so, you, you can run it for a long time. So, mainly the FPGAs are used for uh, prototype checking. There are low cost FPGAs like Spartan which can be used in a mass produced item. But uh, it is all about the economy that uh, uh, you make a 10 dollar FPGA and you put it in a consumer device uh, maybe in a set box maybe in a TV. Uh, the but 
uh, always the people think of uh, integrating that logic into part of an ASIC because there will be some CPU related uh, SOC uh, which is working. So, why not put this whatever logic which was there an FPGA into that ASIC. So, um, whatever even if the low cost FPGAs are used uh, there is a great chance that the logic within that FPGA get absorbed um, into the SOC which is being built. So, by and large I would say the uh, the use of FPGA is uh, in uh, the IP development and in prototyping and which it which which is a huge role you know you should not underestimate uh, saying that you do not see an FPGA in a, in a commercial uh, device which is mass produced, uh, but uh, there is uh, kind of uh, the particular place for FPGA in this particular design space. And one can play with the different high performance architectures like uh, uh, accelerators you know you want to speed up something and uh, you can use FPGA ok. And uh, that um, once you know you can try out various algorithm when it is successful you can make an intellectual property that can be later translated to uh, uh, an ASIC you know. So, uh, and the high performance we know that uh, the FPGA clocks at a very low clock frequency compared to ASIC, uh, but uh, you still you can get very high performance out of FPGA because you can parallelize computation ok. So, assume that you are doing some packet processing in FPGA say you want to do um, say a networks uh, you know kind of security device say intrusion detection device where you have to analyze a packet ok. Now, when you get a packet you get it serially you convert into parallel ok. Uh, now, maybe you have to look at the addresses ok, uh, the destination IP, source IP, the port numbers of TCP. Uh, the basic idea is that once you parallelize it you can do a parallel processing ok. You can look up say you do not have to look at sequentially you do not have to say first look at the destination uh, uh, IP address then source IP address then the protocol number everything can be looked up parallelly you know you put while reading when you convert serial to parallel you store this bit stream in a wide memory like maybe 128 bit wide memory and read the 128 byte all together 128 sorry 128 bit you know all together and do the parallel processing you know kind of simultaneously look at the uh, the source IP address destination IP address source port address destination port address even if you want to look at the higher level suppose you are doing some uh, HTTP uh, kind of uh, protocol processing or parsing say you want to look at the SQL queries because there could be attack on through SQL. SQL. So, uh, these are deep inside the packet uh, the TCP within the TCP payload and so that can be parallelly looked at. So, that way uh, the performance will be quite high. So, that is how one achieve high performance um, using uh, the FPGA. So, you do a parallel you know you make a wide data bus and wide memories and you do the parallel processing. Sometime you may have to use multiple memories like uh, you have the say the maximum possible memory width is 128 bit. So, what you do is that you put two such memories and uh, the memory output can be kind of parallelly feeding your processing logic ok. And sometime we use multi port memories ok. So, you have a um, four port memory where two ports are writing two port are reading different location and doing parallel processing. So, all these techniques can be um, uh, used to extract high performance and one thing I have not touched because this was a uh, kind of basic course I wanted to kind of take you from with a minimal background uh, to a good level that was the intention of the course. But there are many things you know I have not seriously discussed the synchronization or these high performance techniques. Um, one thing I have not mentioned is the pipelining. So, wherein a data path operation can be kind of 
um, sequence through registers. The idea is that uh, say you are adding uh, very simple you have a ripple adder okay? and um, normally you give an 8 bit ripple adder all the 8 bits are added together. But it is possible that um, you introduce a register such that the, the when two least significant bits are added and then in the second stage the next two bits are added okay? and while the first data second bits are added uh, the new data can come in and the LSP of the new data can be added. Okay? So, there, there are it is possible that 8 additions can happen parallelly it involves a lot of memory to store the previous results and so on. Okay? Uh, but that is essentially pipelining you may have uh, kind of studied that in the context of CPU. But pipelining is a general technique which is not only really in hardware uh, it you know it uh, um, kind of it stems from the factory assembly line automation and uh, if you want to look at the hilarious uh, background you can look at the uh, Charlie Chaplin's modern times how the, the automated factory line works. So, basic principle is that so th through pipelining when the, the data is streaming okay, pipelining is useful only if the input data is coming continuously. Uh, in such cases you can get very high throughput uh, by pipelining. Okay. So, that is another way of uh, getting high performance using FPGA. So, I think I have briefly mentioned how to perform. Uh, you know high performance computation with an FPGA by parallel processing uh, by replicating the computational engines you know you have a basic code doing some basic computation you can replicate it uh, to do things parallelly then you can do pipelining to get high throughput. So, these are the different method of achieving very high performance and you can use uh, like uh, the multi port memories uh, which aids in kind of parallel uh, computation because you can write through one port you can read through one port or you can read through multiple port from multiple location uh, for the processing to proceed parallelly. All these techniques can improve very high throughput and uh, we have implemented very high throughput um, um, kind of uh, processing uh, which is sometime kind of um, uh, quite surprising that uh, with a low very low clocking like 200 megahertz you can achieve such high frequency. That is one reason the FPGAs give very high serial uh, ports you know there are there are serial ports which clock at gigabits okay, uh, gigahertz. So, that you can get in the data very fast then parallelize it though the internal clocks are low you can do a parallel computing. So, that is a basic uh, idea about high performance design using FPGA. So, uh, please go through the FPGA lectures I have I have given uh, try to understand it and you will be able to do good design and I wish you all the best and thank you.